Baba, I had uh, the good fortune of uh, being able to have the opportunity to work in the super specialty hospital, uh, hospitals uh, that are totally giving free humanitarian service, absolute free health care. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to do the service over there, I also had the good fortune of having personal interaction with Baba. To date, uh, since I went and saw him in, first in 91, I had about 25 personal inter, uh, interactions or interviews or uh, audiences with him. So I had a lot of opportunities to uh, ask questions. Um, he also revealed to me that uh, uh, the mystery of his uh, open or uh, best kept secret, in other words, there are about people from 165 countries that come and, and visit him and glorify his um, you know, divinity and everything because they had personal experiences of one kind or the other. Yet, in the mainstream of these countries, nobody knows about Baba. How is that possible? And uh, this is again goes to the teachings of Sai Baba. When we read his teachings and understand his teachings, he always very clearly emphasizes the importance of searching for truth and not being carried away by the name and form. So but even when devotees are there, he takes personal interest in serving the devotees. Usually spiritual teachers, they sit in one place and then everybody has to come them, you know, and they can grant this and that. But he comes to the devotees and he serves in person when he's giving things, he actually gives to them. Diamond. But having come in contact with Baba, the entire approach to life uh, has changed from <coughs> one of uh, uh, selfishness to that of selflessness. Um, for me, uh, after full inquiry and, and searching in you know the truth as I was, um, when I came to uh, see him uh, face to face first time in 1991, all that I was interested to see is how he is working, how he is doing. You know, is there any ego in him? Um, is he doing this for personal glorification, whatever healings and miracles and building hospitals and universities? <clears throat> is this for self-glorification or is this an expression of love? And, uh, so when I first had his uh, darshan, which is seeing him in person, I could see never a trace of any ego except uh, the childlike uh, uh, divine innocence and expression of full love. A medical doctor who believes mostly in the healing powers of love. Dr. Venkat Kanabadi is the former regional president of Region 5 of the Sri Satya Sai Baba Centers of the United States. This Fort Wayne, Indiana resident has had dozens of first-person exchanges with Sai Baba in India, including many more since the date of this recording. Dr. Kanabadi is a living example of Sai Baba's principal teachings learn love, teach love, be love. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview was recorded on September 14th, 2002. Uh, my spiritual uh, search or journey started very, very young, uh, when I was even uh, four or five years old. Um, I always used to wonder and ponder about uh, the mystery of the universe, you know, the uh, stars, the galaxies, and uh, the immensity of this uh, creation, and the role man has to play in its uh, entirety, and uh, what is the purpose of uh, taking human birth, and what is God, and uh, what is nature, and what is the relationship between these three, uh, the man, God, and nature. <coughs> I always used to um, love solitude and, and look into the skies and just uh, used to feel lost in the glory and beauty of it all. But uh, my search, you know, as I was going through uh, schooling and all that, um, uh, was to look for the uh, traditional uh, spiritual uh, path uh, which you are born into. For me, it is a Hindu family. Uh, with its uh, uh, tradition, culture, and, and uh, understanding of uh, God. Uh, mostly it starts out uh, as uh, uh, idol worship and uh, a lot of uh, names and a lot of God's names were given. And uh, so I used to wonder why there are so many names and so many gods and what is the real meaning of it all. 
<coughs> but also as I would um, observe the um, <coughs> people in the village where I was brought up, when they do the festivals and all that, they uh, invoke this uh, particular whatever god they uh, pray to, but also they would uh, do uh, some sacrifices, uh, nevertheless in the name of glorifying God, uh, offering some small animals as a sacrifice, this and that, and that uh, bothered me. You know, if there is God and, and uh, He made this creation and universe, and how come He would want something uh, where another life is hurt? And, and so, uh, and I would ask some of these questions to some of the elders, but none of them are uh, well versed enough in the scriptures to uh, enlighten me on anything. So. Uh, I had to seek it on my own, uh, read some books, but uh, you know, being uh, young age and not able to comprehend some of the uh, meanings of the scriptures, I would read, but nevertheless I couldn't comprehend. So during that time uh, in our village, there were Christian missionaries uh, who came and taught uh, the power of love and the message of Jesus. and. Uh, and the oneness of it all and God as one and uh, embodiment of love. So that appealed to me very much and so I basically um, took it up as a path to find my answers. And um, so I would uh, go to the um, prayer meetings and, and uh, begin to ask questions and they would uh, very lovingly uh, try to explain things. But when it comes to uh, the understanding that uh, um, when they say there is only one way, that is Jesus and nothing but, then I would ask, you know, how come uh, there could be only one way when there are zillion people in the world and uh, there are so many well-known paths and, and uh, I am very positive there are enlightened masters in every path, uh, whether it is Buddhism or Hinduism or uh, uh, Islam or, or um, Christianity, so it is. Um, it doesn't sound proper to think that um, God has chosen only one way to reveal Himself and not the others. And so, what do you say for that? And they would have no answer. They would say, "This is it. Otherwise, you will be condemned to hell." Even a, even for the people who had never heard the name Jesus. Yeah. Or uh, people, you know, who are illiterate, who doesn't, who don't even know anything about Bible or uh, its name even, and so they would simply say, all those will be condemned to hell, and that seemed very unreasonable to me. A loving God will never be able to do that, and He should uh, have avenues for each one to reach out in their own way to the truth. Before you go on, how old were you when you left the traditional Hindu thinking philosophy to take on this Christian thinking? About 10 years old. And then how many years did you practice the Christian uh, approach? Um, basically about three, four years. Okay. Three, four years. So you were still very young making these fundamental conclusions yeah. about uh, what the mystery of these religions is all about. Yeah. And uh, at that time uh, my um, uh, father, uh, which is actually my elder father, my um, adopted our foster father. Um, he's the one who adopted me to raise me and uh, so he also uh, took up Christianity uh, because of his health reasons because some of these missionaries said that uh, if you take up Christianity Jesus will heal you from your asthma mm -hmm. and all that. So he took it up along with me and we used to go to convocations and I used to raise in the thousands of people, read the Bible when the pastor would or priest would ask for someone to raise and read. I, I did all that, but in one of those uh, meetings uh, with severe asthma attack, my elder father passed on. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so then at that time, um, I had uh, uh, deeper questions and, and uh, uh, why would uh, someone who is seeking truth and God uh, should be put through such trial and tribulation and, uh, and none of these priests or uh, uh, teachers could answer those questions. And so basically I said uh, the truth is hidden somewhere um, beyond these priests and, and uh, so I had to search further. Um, I would love Jesus, I love his teachings, I love him as the master but uh, they are not able to explain all that he is telling me. What particular Christian denomination were you following at that time? 
This was uh, not actually any traditional. Um, he's one of the. It is headed by one uh, Sikh. Um, um, He's a, he's a Hindu, but uh, Sikhism. He's uh, he's a Sikh, mm -hmm. and he's a converted Christian. But he had profound experiences as his teacher and himself were meditating in Himalayas on Jesus, and uh, they had profound experiences. And th they started their own world ministry, on Christian ministry. Yeah, uh, Christian ministry, and so basically, um, uh, it's a Hebron ministry. Okay. They call it. It's right. not uh, traditional Catholic. Catholicism or uh, Baptist, uh, Baptist or mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witness, anything like that. It is uh, Hebron Ministries. So you're about ready to move on now in your, in your middle teen years. Right. So that is the time when I was also um, uh, about to get into medical school. About the age of 18, I was uh, entering into the medical school. And um, so um, Science seemed like a great avenue search for truth, especially medical science. Um, since I'm not able to find all the answers, and I knew within my heart this God, so-called God, is a uh, cosmic force that uh, may have many names, but uh, it is behind all this manifest universe making it all operate. So uh, I thought maybe science has a way to unravel the truth uh, without actually having a name to it, because search for truth is the nature of science. Mm -hmm. So when I was going through a medical school um, and I was studying embryology and all other uh, fields, uh, then I thought this must be able to answer some of the deeper questions. And, and the mystery of um, uh, um, forming the embryo and developing into fetus and then complex human being and all. And, and uh, it all uh, was coming together, but still, you know, the higher questions of uh, why um, the human uh, is forming this complex way, and, and although the human evolution within the uterus uh, symbolically represents uh, the evolution of the universe uh, in terms of uh, uh, if uh, embryology is looked into, the, the fetus goes through the same stages as uh, fish, uh, as uh, amphibian, as uh, um, uh, terrestrial, and all those uh, beautiful evolutionary stages the embryo goes through. Mm -hmm. So then I was thinking, oh, there may be a connection between uh, development of the human s within the uterus and also the evolution of universe outside. And so there may be a link here to know the truth of it all between man, nature and mm -hmm. God. And, uh, but uh, as I was um, continuing the search, still um, uh, the higher answers would elude me through science. Uh, uh, that's the time when one of the mystics, mystic sages, um, in his uh, higher states of meditation, this is a mystic from uh, uh, 1600s, was actually describing the um, uh, evolution of the fetus in the uh, in the uterus, uh, and this is a, just a sage, a, a mystic, uh, has no knowledge of medicine, and medicine was only advanced uh, in the last uh, maybe hundred years or so. Do you recall the name of this mystic? Uh, it's uh, Yogi um, um, Brahma. Okay. Um, uh, <coughs> and how did you happen across his? You know, read his book okay. and, and his prophecies and all that, and also his mystic revelations. Mm -hmm. And then it occurred to me, then, if a mystic could know all the small details of the uh, uh, unfoldment of the embryo... Hundreds of years ago. Yeah, before uh, the medical science could find it, there may be a link for the mysticism, the truth, and the science as well. So, the, the mystic aspect of human life and, and the creation and all that uh, uh, began to appeal to me. And so, um, uh, and also I was beginning to understand the limitations of the science because I could see science is searching truth through employing the five senses mm -hmm. of sight, sound, and touch, smell, and taste. And uh, the science is able to expand those senses in terms of a microscope to see the minute and telescopes to see the distance, just expanding the sight. And, and same thing, expanding the sound in terms of ultrasound and um, all that, but still it is limited to the understanding of these senses. And, and so the truth seemed beyond. The sage could not have used these senses 
to understand the intricacies of a development of fetus. So there may be higher knowledge that is channeled through somehow that is not limited to the senses. So then it, it occurred to me that uh, as I search for the truth, maybe the higher, higher truths will be revealed to me or the mysteries may be revealed. So then in my search for the truth, uh, by the time I finished my medical school, my surgical training, and and came to this country, which is USA, um, in turn in search of uh, higher studies and also you know practice of medicine, um, my search continued for the truth uh, along the lines. Did you ever have any thoughts, Venkat, of abandoning medicine, science, and pursuing the truths you were looking for? via the field of spirituality by becoming no, a minister? It never um, uh, uh, occurred to me in the sense, you know, I could still use uh, the avenue that I'm in to search for truth while I search through the spiritual channels also. So I never found a conflict uh, that I could still do what I'm doing and still search for truth. Mm -hmm. So it was simultaneous progress um, in that sense. So in the process of searching for truth, then I ended up meeting a lot of masters, spiritual teachers of different traditions and also um, not only personally meeting them and asking them questions but also studying the scriptures. Um, I already read the uh, Bible with uh, the teachers mm -hmm. of Christianity and then um, I was reading uh, different different traditions of Buddhism and, and Islam and, uh, uh, and also the Hindu uh, traditions of uh, Vedas and Upanishads, which is a higher knowledge component of Hinduism. Uh, as I was uh, attending some of the seminars and courses by these uh, masters, they would reveal the higher aspect or the deeper meanings of this uh, relationship between God, nature and, and uh, man. And uh, in the um, aspect of Hindu philosophy, and there is this uh, component called Vedanta, which is the knowledge component, which ultimately was able to give me all the answers that I was seeking through the intellect. Hmm. Uh, how this uh, universe came to manifest, and uh, how the human came to manifest, and uh, what is the journey of the soul, and uh, how is this all uh, fitting together in the grand scheme of things, and how and that Supreme Consciousness uh, is not limited to one form and it is accessible to all, whether it's literate, illiterate, uh, labeled as Christian, Hindu, Muslim, doesn't matter. It's desire and application yeah. of interest. That right, is. and searching for truth is what the requirement is and then everybody, whether it's a tribe, man of uh, tribal origin or a scholar of uh, scientific uh, universities, doesn't matter. They have equal access a to it. Equal access and that began to appeal to me and answer a lot of my questions that this so-called Godhead or uh, cosmic consciousness is not limited to a form and name, although they c it can manifest through that. Science and medicine must have seemed, by comparison, very limiting to you. Yeah, it was, uh, but I could see it as, as a, an avenue where it will take you so far and then uh, lead you further. So it is not in conflict, it is in uh, so-called complementing. Mm -hmm. So it will lead you uh, to a certain point and beyond it, you still have to continue through the um, search for avenues to seek the higher knowledge, which will come through the process called intuitive knowledge, mm -hmm. which is beyond intellect. And that is channeled through when we align our spirit with the cosmic spirit. And again, everybody has equal access to developing this faculty. This faculty, yes. Yeah. So the only requirement is search for truth and, and um, the determination to follow through it. Now, how old were you when you graduated from medical school and came to America? I graduated uh, in tw at the age of 23 from medical school and then Very I... Very young, isn't it? For India it is about normal, you know, and uh, then I did my master's in surgical training, so I finished that by 20, 26 and then I worked there for another year as a surgeon and in the 28th year I came here and did my anesthesia training along, you know, uh, here. And now you're in Fort Wade, Indiana as an anesthesiologist? Yeah, right. I'm a consulting anesthesiologist uh, in a group practice. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of uh, variety of procedures, uh, cardiac anesthesia, neuro anesthesia, pediatric, and all the subspecialties. But my main interest is in uh, 
uh, cardiac anesthesia, neuro anesthesia, and pediatrics. And it so happened, as I was uh, mentioning to you, uh, after meeting so many of these masters and teachers, uh, my intellectual search came to a point of being satisfied, meaning I had all the intellectual questions answered. You really thought you had them all answered? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at that moment, but no experiential basis. Mm -hmm. You know, meaning my intellect was uh, satisfied in that <clears throat> this cosmic self or the truth uh, or God is not um, limited by certain traditions or religions and all that. It is accessible to all. It manifests through the creation as well as through the human beings and it is all one. And, uh, and a lot of intricate questions that I had in relation to that were also answered through this Vedanta, the, the knowledge component of Hindu philosophy, which is very deep and very profound. And it also defined God as cosmic consciousness. It, did, didn't, it didn't define God as Lord Krishna, Rama, Jesus, Buddha, no. The definition in Sanskrit is called Pragnanam Brahma, meaning consciousness is God. And so that set a, a good foundation for my search because I always had the feeling that should be the answer. So at an early age, um, regardless of the tradition, the spiritual practice you were brought up in, the, the, the several tra practices, you came to the understanding that all is God, that everything yeah. is God. Anything that's part of the consciousness has to be God. God. So in that way, my intellect was satisfied, but within me there is still the deep discontent uh, that how to experience this, you know. The scriptures say that this cosmic consciousness can come in human form once in a while to guide the mankind when it is uh, uh, erring or making mistakes or going off the path. Uh, and uh, and all the scriptures uh, talked about it. Uh, Christianity talked about it um, coming as Jesus, and uh, Buddhism talked about that cosmic spirit coming as Buddha, and, and mm -hmm. Hindu traditions speak about that cosmic consciousness coming in the human form as Krishna and Rama. And so I was wondering, if that is really possible, how should I really have an interaction with it? Is there anything that I could really relate to it in this age and time, anything that is really close to that concept, that cosmic consciousness which is behind it all, also can be confined in a limited human form and still maintain the uh, limitlessness and infiniteness and, and the full glory uh, while it is expressing itself through a limited containment of a human form. So once again, you came up with some of the heaviest questions anybody could ever attempt to resolve. How did you go about resolving those? So then, <clears throat> then that is the time um, after having met and studied a lot of teachers, um, I fumbled on the teachings of uh, such a Sai Baba. How did you find out about Sai Baba? Uh, actually, one of our friends gave a book about his teachings. And then I was more interested in the teachings um, because I just wanted to see if he has anything else to offer because uh, I didn't know a whole lot ac except that he can make miracles and, and in Hindu tradition it's not uncommon for yogis to make a lot of miracles. So I was not too concerned about the miracle part but I was concerned if he has anything special to offer in terms of teachings that I didn't have before and how he could actually make a difference if at all um, than what I already had. Were you in this country living as a, um, a citizen when you first learned of Sai Baba? Uh, actually, uh, interestingly, I knew of him when I was in medical school in India. Mm -hmm. He actually came to the college campus area when I was in medical school, but I had no interest at the time either to go and listen to him or meet him or see him either because I heard a lot of uh, negative uh, publicity about him, that he's a miracle man and this is fraud, this is fraud, that, this and that. So I had no judgment at that time, either one way or the other. I just thought maybe another spiritual holy man, maybe he has something good to offer, maybe not, I don't know. Yet by that time you had already uh, convinced anybody who was aware of you that you were a serious spiritual seeker. So what was the difference then when you finally decided to pay attention to him later on? So that is the main thing. I just wanted to see if his uh, teachings uh, could offer me any answers that I still couldn't find from these uh, masters, mm -hmm. from these teachers. And uh, as I was going through his uh, teachings, uh, certainly, lo and behold, some of the um, uh, secrets of the messages that could not be revealed by the teachers who basically said, 
you just follow the path you you cannot get everything through the intellect you cannot get every answer so you just have to follow at that time some of the answers that he gave uh, for some of those same questions that I could not find answers were uh, uh, really profound and very simple and how many years ago was this that you had rediscovered Sai Baba then? It was uh, in um, 87. And you were well established in America by that yeah, time? Yes, I was a practicing physician and I, by the time I, m I met a lot of teachers and well into search of the truth in, in Big Bay. And uh, so next three years I was uh, fully reading his uh, um, messages and his teachings and listening to his talks. Um, knowing about everything about him uh, without any judgment and, and uh, I began to see some of his uh, answers to some of the deepest questions that other teachers uh, said you just wait uh, were able to be revealed in the most simple way and then I began to relate to the teachings of Jesus and Buddha that uh, wasn't it that the divine when it manifests the distinct quality should be make the complex teachings simple and uh, not be secluded to the Himalayas or not to the ashrams somewhere but be in the middle of the mankind, middle of the masses. And uh, when I looked at the life of Jesus or Buddha, they were in the middle of the mankind. They are not secluded in Himalayas or some caves and, and only imported the teachings only for the select few. So that I thought is the distinct feature of a manifest divinity that uh, they should be in the middle, yet they should be able to impart the highest knowledge. You said you approached uh, the study of Sai Baba this time by <coughs> not judging, by not drawing any conclusions. Did you have any occasions to confront um, teachings, elements written about Sai Baba that set off any danger signals or did you find yourself wondering whether or not you understood this as fully uh, as you should to avoid drawing the wrong conclusion perhaps. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, at least uh, from the intellectual side, I wanted to not uh, get drawn by the externals. I always wanted um, the search for truth. That's the only guiding principle I had. So, and time and again when I was studying his teachings, he would say, um, that's all I want you to uh, have, uh, have the deepest desire to know the truth and then you can come uh, and see and examine, inquire about me, then that's the only way you can come to know of me. Mm -hmm. uh, so he didn't put any other condition other than the deepest desire to know the truth, which was the main thing for me. And he didn't, uh, he never, uh, even in his discourses, he would never give too much importance for the miracles that he would perform. And some of his teachings are so profoundly similar to Jesus that uh, Jesus never took credit for all the miracles that he did either. He just would uh, say, it is your faith that healed. Uh, because of your faith, the divine uh, consciousness will make this uh, flow as a grace to bring about the healing. And that's exactly what Jesus um, Baba would say. Then Venkat, for the benefit of those who might be seeing this and hearing from about you for the first time, let me ask the basic question for you to answer, who is Sai Baba? Um, for me, uh, after full inquiry and, and searching in you know, the truth as I was, um, when I came to uh, see him uh, face to face first time in 1991, all that I was interested to see is how he is working, how he is doing, you know, is there any ego in him? Um, is he doing this for personal glorification, whatever healings and miracles and building hospitals and universities? <clears throat> is this for self-glorification or is this an expression of love? So my only um, uh, requirement and prayer when I was first there to visit him was to grant me a way to uh, see the truth. And, and uh, so when I first had his uh, darshan, uh, which is seeing him in person, I could see never a trace of any ego except uh, the childlike uh, uh, divine innocence and expression of full love. And so then, um, for me, it manifested, or it was more like uh, um, the divine love walking on earth uh, 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 on in human form. So all that I could see is uh, manifest selflessness, manifest love, um, manifest goodness in human form, without any trace of ego. 
just playfulness, just joy. What, looking back over the years then, since you first heard of Sai Baba back in your mid-20s, uh, what made you then not become so concerned about whatever negative stories you heard about him back when, in your mid-20s and whatever negative stories that are swirling around him today, because surely there are, as there are for all prominent people. How do you account for the negative stories? How do you account for your disinterest in having those influence your thinking? Yeah, I would, uh, in those years, in the uh, early 20s, when I was in medical school, uh, the reason I didn't pay attention to the, any negative uh, publicity about him is it came through the movies and, and uh, uh, groups of uh, um, some vested interest in promoting their own uh, aspects of uh, gurus or, or their own cults and things like that. So I didn't pay attention because of the sources from which this criticism came. Or from, um, so I just left it alone. I, I was not interested uh, in either uh, um, criticism of Baba or praising of Baba, I had not much information about him anyway. So my approach at that time was, why should I be judgmental about someone that I don't have any idea about? So I just left it like that. And what about today? In the today, uh, the way I see it is, uh, <coughs> Baba, I had uh, the good fortune of uh, being able to have the opportunity to work in the super specialty hospital, uh, hospitals uh, that are totally giving free humanitarian service, absolute free health care. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to do the service over there, I also had the good fortune of having personal interaction with Baba. Uh, to date, uh, since I went and saw him in, first in 91, I had about 25 personal inter, uh, interactions or interviews or uh, audiences with him. So I had a lot of opportunities to uh, ask questions besides reading his uh, extensive uh, uh, discourses and literature. And so some of them uh, he revealed in person the answers for some of the things that uh, you were asking. What about the negative publicity or negative uh, uh, issues that are revolving around Baba at this time? And uh, so for me, uh, the, the revelation came very, very profound in that even when I mentioned to him about people who at one time were great devotees of him, who were only publicizing his glory and love, turned against and then now um, spreading malice and, and uh, negativity, then I asked him about that and, and he said that uh, these people are also in search of truth. Um, nevertheless, when they are uh, in the final stages of merging with the um, uh, ocean or the cosmic consciousness, it's like a river coming into merging with the ocean. There will be a lot of turmoil and turbulence mm -hmm. and they will put to the hard test. The ocean is trying to push away the uh, river and the river is trying to merge and so there will be a lot of uh, churning and swirling and so this is like the testing time mm -hmm. for them. And whether they will be able to withstand and finally merge in the heart of the ocean, in the middle of the night, it is up to them. If they search for the truth and stay with the love, they will be able to come to know and be with me and merge with me. So his answer was only love, mm -hmm. it's not judgment against them. And um, he also revealed to me that uh, uh, the mystery of his uh, open or uh, best kept secret, in other words, there are about people from 165 countries that come and, and visit him and glorify his um, you know, divinity and everything because they had personal experiences of one kind or the other. Yet, in the mainstream of these countries, nobody knows about Baba. How is that possible? When yes, people, especially here in America. Yeah, in America or even um, most of these countries, mainstream is, is like a secret. And how is this possible? And, and at one time, some of the Western devotees asked him, and, and also uh, it came very clear to me through interactions with him that it is his divine will uh, to keep it that way until it is time to reveal himself. And he called this a window where these souls, through their lifetimes, they were praying for personal interaction with the divine when it is in human form. So that if he reveal himself to the entire globe, these souls will not have access to him in person and, and have uh, darshan or interaction with him. So this is a window that is specially created 
for these devotees around the globe, uh, however many countries, and uh, there will come a time when he will lift this veil where the secret will be um, taken out. And now that's something I would imagine a healthy person's healthy ego could have a field day with, knowing that they're selected to come closer to Baba at this time, yeah. without the distraction of the <coughs> six billion other neighbors on this planet finding out about Baba at the same time. So this is uh, it's, it's a secret, uh, you know, best kept secret in the sense because of uh, the select purpose by the divinity itself to allow these souls. But again, those that are in search of real truth should not be carried away by the personal spiritual egos mm -hmm. because they know that it is a granted prayer, but uh, it is not a special group or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So they shouldn't be, if they are carried, then they will be gone again. They will be drifted off. Well, he's not a young man today, Venkat, as you know. When do you think this veil might be lifted by his own will? <coughs> Again, uh, it's, it's in divine plan and uh, there is no second guessing because whenever we try to guess, he'll outguess us. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming to the point of why he will create these situations where there is some negativity publicized around him, is to precisely keep those that are trying to come that are not deserving to come. Or even those that may have come to him uh, for some good karma, but not putting enough effort to improve on their journey or unfolding their spiritual self, then they have to be moved away from this spiritual contact with the divine human form. And so he will create these negative stories or things by himself so that he will uh, let these people kick themselves out of this um, contact. So in other words, he will never say, it is your time is done, you go away. He will never say that. But he will create a situation where he will create the biggest doubt that you could have about the divinity of it, and then uh, we will move away from it. And so it is also in the divine plan. And that came very clear to me through interactions with him that he is the master director of it all, whether it is negativity, positivity, or neutrality, whatever it is. He is the master director solely, uh, especially and explicitly interested in the unfoldment of the individual self of each one of us. Whatever he does, he will do that will benefit our journey to know that we are the divine self. Anybody who sees this for the first time finding out about Sai Baba, should they feel as if they have an invitation to come and explore who this person is more because you've introduced him to them or should they wait to be called as you suggest those who are closest to him seem to be called? See, the calling, as uh, Baba says it, uh, you know, everyone is called. Nobody can come without the explicit calling. What does that mean in the deepest spiritual sense? The calling can be in one of three ways. It's when we have a lot of good merit in our uh, journey through lifetimes and what is called good karma, then uh, that itself will qualify us to interact. And of course, our prayers in the past lives combined with the good merits, it will qualify us to go and visit him. So we'll have a desire to go and see and, and interact, so we'll buy a ticket and go. But uh, outside it feels like, well, you know, nobody invited me, so I'm going, and, and so where is this, what is the meaning of this special calling? I didn't feel any special calling or anything. But the good karma that is there is, is the real calling card for them. But they will come to know of it later. Mm -hmm. and, and the other one is um, the search for truth. When someone is in search of the ultimate truth of what this is God all about and, and, and the connection between the truth, the nature and the man, and in search of that, there will come a point in their journey that they have to come face to face with that uh, cosmic consciousness in human form. So then they will be given an opportunity to come. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, those people are the ones, usually they stay the journey the rest of the way. Because you you, you've given me every indication of being a, uh, a spiritually interested holy person since the time you were a young boy. Uh, all through your adolescence, your teenage years, your young adult years. Can you share with us in some ways in which Sai Baba has changed you over the last 15 years that you've really paid attention to him? Yeah, I, I would um, certainly um, share that with a lot of joy because um, uh, he changed me as a person in that, uh, you know, before all the teachings were uh, uh, intellectual curiosity and satisfying my intellect, but nothing really happened in the inner transformation. 
it's all just like uh, associating with some teachers and going there attending some lectures and clapping and you know satisfying my intellect and feeling good about it coming home and nothing ever changed but having come in contact with Baba the entire approach to life uh, has changed from <coughs> one of uh, uh, selfishness to that of selflessness um, before all the existence is always what is it there for me in this given situation in this job in this uh, relationship and all that although you don't say it in loud but in the heart of hearts that's what your intention is is there anything for me in it how do I gain from yeah this? gain or you know it's, it's a deep desire that mm -hmm. you want to benefit some way but uh, after coming to Baba the the uh, priorities are set straight in that uh, if you are the cosmic self and you are expressing yourself through this form and you are interconnected with the entire, entire creation and you are part of the entire creation, doesn't that make sense that you respect all creation, you uh, treat them as your own and, and be good to them because it's yourself. And so the selflessness and service aspects um, uh, came um, as a practical um, transformation for me, not only in my profession, you know, before that also I took up medical career because of the avenue to do service for the mankind. Mm -hmm. But it came much more crystal clear that, uh, that I could use this avenue to do the work that is meant for me in mm -hmm. terms of service. So then um, it, um, when I do things uh, it became much more easier to um, share whatever resources I am gifted with are given mm -hmm. uh, with uh, freedom without any um, intention of self-glorification or personal gain from it. And that is biggest transformation that, that actually happened after coming in association with him before it was theory. In theory, I knew all that before, but it didn't happen before. So you applied the practice <coughs> of it. Yeah, because of his personal example, mm -hmm. because of his love and, and uh, seeing him in action, how he deals with the devotees, how he deals with the poor and the rich, and how um, through the projects of immense uh, uh, magnitude, either in um, health care or uh, education or uh, social care in terms of water projects and all that, and not only that, even when devotees are there, he takes personal interest in serving the devotees. Usually spiritual teachers, they sit in one place and then everybody has to come them, you know, and they can grant this and that. But he comes to the devotees and he serves in person when he's giving things, he actually gives to them. I, I understand there can be 90,000, 190,000 people there on any given days. He has undoubtedly favored you, as you said, with more than two dozen personal interviews. Where do you think, and this might be a tough question, where do you think your f spiritual views might be of Sai Baba had he never graced you with a personal invitation to sit down and talk with him? Um, actually, you know, first three years I had no interview. I uh, would go there, uh, stand in lines for hours and uh, sit and meditate and, and pray and uh, his interaction was only in the main lines and all that. So my search for his um, uh, divinity and his expression of his love uh, never faded because he didn't grant me an interview in the first few years. But I, I thought it would be a great privilege if he did one, give one. Mm -hmm. But uh, in his grace, he granted many. But that helped me to clarify a lot of things for my own personal uh, growth and also to share with uh, fellow brothers. And But I don't consider that as a reason why uh, I am convinced that he is divine, but actually that can create a, an issue where you come closer to the divinity and you can raise a lot more questions because you can begin to see this, this and that and say, well, isn't he absolutely simply another human with ego or is he divine and all that. So it gives a closer examination ground uh, in terms of uh, validating what we may have thought from a distance. If I were a practicing Jew listening to you, or a Muslim, or Buddhist, or a Catholic, or a Baptist, and I heard you talk about this man who is divine, I would have a choice, I would have a dilemma to continue practicing my own spiritual tradition or to leave it to follow him. What do people do when they hear about this man described as you're describing him? 
And uh, this is again goes to the teachings of Sai Baba. When we read his teachings and understand his teachings, he always very clearly emphasizes the importance of searching for truth and not being carried away by the name and form. So he always says, if you are a Jew, be a Jew. But my purpose is to guide you to be a better Jew so that you can come to the truth that you are looking for face to face through your own faith and understanding. And uh, so don't be worried about this name and form. And the uh, same thing if you are a Catholic, if you are a Hindu, if you are a Muslim, simply it doesn't matter. These are simply labels for searching the truth. And they are given certain avenues because of the masters that came in the tradition and set certain ways for search of the truth. All that you need is have the absolute desire to know the truth and, and which is love, the divine love and search it uh, in the intensity that you would love to see that face to face mm -hmm. and then you come to know of my existence my presence at that time not because of this but because of your um, immense desire to know the truth then you will come to know of me at that point not because of your visit to Puttaparthi and things like that. Dr. Venkat we only have a few minutes left and I don't want to take too much of your busy day but perhaps we should talk about this busy day of yours. Your at a retreat sponsored by the world famous Cleveland Clinic where many scientists come together to learn more scientific ways of bringing healing to people who are ill. And yet your purpose here today is to talk about healing through traditionally non-scientific ways, the power of love. Would you shed a little light as to how that goes hand, can go hand in hand with scientifically oriented organizations such as the Cleveland Clinic? Uh, this is uh, a great opportunity to bring together uh, the ancient wisdom uh, into the mainstream science and so I feel uh, pretty uh, fortunate that I am given this opportunity um, to bring uh, together these young doctors uh, this knowledge where we could some way synthesize the modern medicine with the um, knowledge of the divine love as a cosmic force which manifests throughout the creation as uh, energy fields and how when it is applied to the human being and understood properly uh, then uh, can be utilized in various um, healing techniques that uh, will um, manipulate or uh, reorient this uh, energy at different levels to bring about the healing and this will fit in very well with the medical science in its advanced stages at this point uh, un of understanding the higher levels of healing as well as the quantum physics that brought so much understanding uh, that we are nothing but energy um, and manifesting at the physical level is only a, a tip of the iceberg. We are not simply the uh, physical beings, we are the energy beings. Um, and, and we manifest at several levels um, as etheric body, as astral body, as a, a mental body, as a causal body and as the spirit. And so actually an illness starts when this energy, this energy of cosmic love is flowing through all these energy fields uh, that we are um, and go coming through the manifest physical person. If there is a blockage uh, at certain level due to either uh, wrong habits of living, wrong food habits, polluted air, polluted water or um, <coughs> various uh, um, uh, issues that bring down the host resistance or body resistance so that these normally coexisting bacteria and all those can become harmful and mm -hmm. create illness. So basically it all boils down to one thing that there is a blockage for the free flow of this cosmic energy called love uh, to circulate through all these uh, energy fields. And so when there is a blockage, it manifests as, as a pain or as an illness. And so when we understand the mechanism uh, for which there is a lot of medical research that is coming through, through the um, uh, instruments that use the magnetic resonance and ultrasound and uh, various technologies that uh, can uh, access the energy fields and give a lot of evidence so that we can understand that this actually starts the illness or disease starts at the energy levels before it manifests and so if we can access that earlier we can actually stop from it manifesting so our approach from problem oriented uh, um, uh, issue uh, problem oriented resolution of the pro issues 
to the preventive oriented uh, approach to health and healing. So this is what uh, I like to bring it to the doctors. This is a group of doctors, family uh, practice residents and faculty from Cleveland Clinic. And uh, at one of my talks uh, in Cleveland, uh, he happened to be there, the director of uh, program, and uh, he felt that this would be beneficial for these young doctors. So mm -hmm. he made this arrangement for me to come and give this talk. So now, I feel privileged for that. Now my intuition suggests to me that one of the reasons why you're able to talk about this um, so authoritatively is because of what you've learned along your spiritual path of the last 10, 15 years with Sai Baba. Would you find it to your advantage or any reason to bring Sai Baba into your discussion? Only if it is uh, uh, appropriate because he is the manifest love as I personally experienced. Um, and uh, he shows through his personal example that uh, when you live in totally love, you can be perfectly healthy. And he is a great example of that. And at 76 years of age, he has no physical ailment in terms of he never uses any reading glasses, he has no arthritis, no blood pressure, no diabetes, no other health issues that anyone could say is absolutely perfect health. I understand also he requires very small amounts of food and little amount of sleep. Right. And so this is again to validate the theoretical information from the scriptures, from the science that when you are fully in connection with the cosmic energy, the reason we need sleep is to conserve energy. The reason we need food is to provide energy. So these are the tangible ways of dealing or managing energy fields that we have. So one is input, one is output. And so we stop the output through sleep and we take the input through the food. But when you are indirectly in contact with the cosmic energy through the energy fields and body, you don't have to depend on them. This has been a fascinating talk. I'll conclude with one last question if it's okay. And that is you're still a vibrant young man who has a foot in the scientific field and a huge foot into the field of spirituality. What is your intention? How do you plan to spend the rest of your life? Uh, God willing and uh, Baba guiding um, the divine in the human form, I consider uh, Sai Baba. Um, I would like to devote my time into bringing synthesis between science, spirituality and, and um, philosophy. Um, you know, philosophy in the sense of the traditional uh, logical understanding of the spirit, um, whereas um, um, religion is, is uh, the normal way of, uh, traditional way of diverting the people towards God, but also science as an avenue, as one of the main pathways towards God, that cosmic spirit or love. So I consider that will be the area where health and healing will be my focus. But uh, to use that as a way to um, bring about the synthesis of the spirit with the science. Well, uh, Dr. Venkat Kanabadi, thank you very much for being so gracious to share with us your feelings today. Thank you very much, Ted, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And uh, hopefully something uh, will fit into your scheme of things as uh, it unfolds in the divine plan that uh, this little message in one way or the other will fit into the scheme of things. Thank, thank you. you very much. Myself, um, one time when I was uh, uh, here in Ashram, I saw a group of nuns from Italy and uh, one of them was in a wheelchair. And one of these, uh, these uh, nuns, <coughs> they wheeled her towards the veranda um, at that time and the Swami uh, talked to the uh, nun in the wheelchair and asked her to get up and she stood. And then uh, started to, and Swami said, walk. And she started walking. Um, you know, Swami um, explains that as, as a, uh, an interaction of uh, love uh, flowing from the divinity to the receiver when there is connection to the absolute love, which is devotion, which is surrender, which is uh, the link from the positive to the negative. Uh, that is a, an example of. Um, the power of the divine through the form of love can bring uh, such a dramatic uh, effect in healing. The other uh, uh, example that I'm going to give is um, the story of uh, Gita Ram. She is the one who uh, <coughs> would go around uh, USA and give some talks. At one time she said, uh, 
she was um, um, playing uh, just nearby a rose and uh, something to do with the rose that uh, uh, Swami uh, came there and then asked if she wanted that particular rose and it was not even blooming so Swami touched it and then right before uh, her and the, the flower uh, bloomed and then with all the fragments and everything. So again, um, here, uh, uh, a physical material object was transformed, which is alive, which is uh, uh, into a full-blown uh, object uh, with all its uh, qualities of a full-blown uh, rose. Uh, again, this is, uh, Swami explains this as the power to transform things from one state to the other uh, through the uh, energy of love. So Swami himself defined love as as the cosmic force um, <clears throat> that forces and that forges the unity of all creation. Mm -hmm. It is also the another name for cosmic consciousness or the cosmic energy. It expresses through our heart as a feeling of oneness and kinship. So at one level, it is the cosmic energy, cosmic force. At another level, it is expressed or understood as an emotion in our, in our hearts. So most of the time, our understanding is through this emotional uh, approach. And so we attribute love as, as an emotion. But in reality, it is at a higher uh, dimension, it is the cosmic force that makes the entire creation come to manifest. So that everybody here probably already know that uh, love has the power to heal. But when it is given through some scientific validating studies, it uh, being a rational mind uh, and, and uh, people with uh, logical thinking, then it's more likely that they will uh, come to accept that this is a valid uh, uh, scientific uh, proof of these things. This uh, gives the actual uh, information about the individuals who had no perception of being loved and lived with a sense of loneliness and isolation had three to five times the higher risk of dying from all causes, which included heart attacks, stroke, infections, autoimmune disorders, uh, premature labor, cancer, alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide, arthritis, of various causes. So there is that much difference uh, in terms of the outcome uh, for the people who are living in loneliness and, and feel that they are not loved. Swami's uh, way of explaining this uh, love and its power to heal uh, at one time, uh, one of the devotees asked, uh, Swami, why do you have to create all these articles and perform all these miracles? And what is the purpose? And uh, Swami simply said uh, that uh, Divine love is formless. It is very difficult for people to experience it without some tangible expression. And using this love energy, I create things and give them as tokens of my love. Mm -hmm. So what he is manifesting is actually the cosmic energy of love into manifest things. And the same energy he uses for healing. And so when we uh, get some um, uh, objects from him, it is an expression of his love for us. But the actual thing that happens is uh, his love is flowing to us and it is converted, it's transformed into material um, that can be seen because we cannot perceive the formless love. And, and so um, we can be very well reassured then that uh, this invisible cosmic love has all this power uh, to bring about all the transformation at all levels of our being and bring about healing and the physical, uh, physiological, uh, mental, emotional uh, and intellectual and spiritual levels.